This is Doogie Hauser, and that is Pumpkin, and this is their roadmap to success. All right, so we'll put this over here. We'll let you chew on a treat. So primarily we worked here with Doogie. Um, uh, 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 Pumpkin is about 14. And so uh, in the video above, we worked on uh, counter conditioning to teach the dog to not, uh, to teach Doogie not to bark at things. But we can do that for a lot of different things. Like I mentioned, we can do it for uh, skateboards. Um, the baby walking is something. Okay, we'll give you one. I probably shouldn't do that because I'm promoting whining for attention, but we didn't give her very many treats throughout the session. So basically, uh, the child in the family is not walking yet, and so sometimes we hold, uh, I always say we, like I'm a part of the family. I feel like I am. <laughs> um, but people, uh, we hold, they hold up the, uh, the child and it helps the dog, uh, child develop a little bit of dexterity in walking and supporting, and that freaks him out a little bit. And so uh, you can use the same counter conditioning technique for that. So take a treat smash it so it's flat like a pancake. Now he's probably not gonna chew it that much because we've given him half a bag of treats, but normally he'd be chewing on it while we have the baby walking towards us. Now remember the baby has to be far enough away where he doesn't perceive to be a threat. If he won't sit down or won't take the treat and he's normally hungry, he's probably just full, then you're too close. So keep on increasing the distance until the dog is happy to sit and watch the child and, then, and make sure when you're holding it, if you notice these three fingers would be underneath his chin, if a lot of people hold like this and you're blocking the dog's visual acuity. So make sure, that's kind of an inside joke on this one. Um, but make sure the dog is looking directly at the child as it's walking towards, and they'll, mm -hmm. the child will get to a certain distance and the dog will probably start, stop taking the treat or want to get up. Then you want to have the child stop at that distance and back up and practice just coming up to that distance over and over until the dog doesn't react. Then you can push a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And eventually you want the child walking all the way up. We have to go very progressively and at the dog's pace. Um, now, before we got to all the exercises, we started off the session by really going over structure, rules, and discipline. Um, exercise, he's probably a little under-exercised. I showed the Guardian some creative ways to exercise him using a laser. Um, since he has some uh, tiny little medical issue, he might not want to use the stairs. Might want to just use the stairs one direction. I can't remember, you want him going up. up. So maybe just throw a treat up the stairs. Uh, every time you're downstairs and he goes up with you, so he doesn't run down the stairs, but he's running up the stairs. Um, and then basically, uh, playing fetch is a great way to do it. Remember when you're playing fetch, as you tell him to sit first, he has to drop the item and then sit before you pick it up. Then you throw it, and as you throw it, you say fetch. When he touches it with his mouth, you say fetch. And when he brings it over to you, hold the treat in front of his mouth and don't say a word. And when he, when he drops it, pop it in his mouth and then say the word fetch. Um, and that way we're associating the command word with all those three things. Um, he's not a high energy dog, but he's a puppy, and so he uh, really needs more exercise. Not as much as her, but make sure you give her a little bit of exercise as well, because I'm sure she'll feel a little bit left out. And it's just a nice way to engage a little bit. Um, now, he doesn't like going for walks, and um, it's kind of unusual. Most dogs really love going for walks. Most of, the, most of the requests I get, how do I get my dog to stop pulling in front of me? They're like pulling him to get him to come with. So you can do things like throwing treats in front, but I think the best thing to do would be to find, uh, and I don't, are you on social media? Mm -hmm. So uh, join the Maltese uh, uh, Owners of America. I'm sure there's like five groups for it. You probably find a Maltese meetup or just look for little tiny dogs. Go to the dog park over on uh, Strand and try to find some people with small dogs that he can get buddies with, that he plays with a little bit. And then if they live in the neighborhood, you can go for walks together. Now he's motivated to want to walk with that other dog. He's having a positive experience. He likes doing that. And he's gonna be more inclined to want to walk uh, in the future. And then you can go with walks without the other dog eventually. Now we talked about some rules um, as well as uh, exercise. Some of the rules, uh, he really only has a couple. So um, I recommended not allowing him on the furniture because for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. Also in his case, it's important because he's a little bit of a marker. And marker marking is an intentional marking of it uh, to let, uh, if another dog were to have to come in here to know that it's my couch. And especially because she's not allowed on the furniture as well. So if she's not allowed and he is, that can create a little bit of a like, jealousy. Um, so I went over how to use the dog bed, and I would recommend going to Groupon, get a dog bed. I prefer one that, like the one that you have, but quite a bit bigger. And the ones that I like to get are uh, either light gray, white, or uh, light cream, uh, because for dogs, uh, they're colorblind, and if you leave a treat there, those colors, the contrast, it makes it easier for them to see. Make sure there's no pattern on it as well, because their eyes are not very good for detail. Um, and throw those treats on it, and message me if you can't. Uh, I have videos for almost everything we're going to talk about here, so if there's any of these things that you don't remember how to do, please message me. Text me is the fastest way to reach me. I get about 50 emails a day. 
And so I have my people handle those, but as a text, uh, program my number in your phone so you can always text me if you have questions directly. Um, so basically, uh, taking away the, uh, the furniture, X mats will help make it easier to manage. Um, and I would say that is the rules should be in place for a minimum of 66 days or as long as the problem is still going on. So for uh, dogs that mark, um, being able to be petted on demand and being able to hire, have a higher, a lot of dogs like this will like to sit up here. Well, now I'm looking down at the humans. So we want to take away the furniture for a period of time. And then after that, it's furniture with an invitation from the human. And it's only for good behavior. So if she, he's up here and he barks, he has to get down. Now, a lot of times what I do is I throw the treat on the ground and the dog goes down and gets it up and licks it up. I say the word off. But if he's on here, he's barking, he's probably not going to want to do that. He loses some authority. So what I do is I push the dog to the edge of the couch, but not all the way off. But I want them to feel like they're about to fall off. So they jump off on their own. Then when they do jump off, I might pet them and say the word off. And then at that point, I'd block them from getting back up or put the X mat here. And for him, probably getting those little X mats and putting them on the front should be sufficient. So you're going to create a little bit of a, uh, a Game of Thrones. You're going to have like the wall around the front of your couch temporarily. Um, after about a month, remove one of them and reposition them. So instead of being a solid wall, there's little gaps. And gradually, you want to do that is gradually take them away. And eventually, he just sees... Uh, I don't go on the, I just am in a habit of not going on the couch. At the same time, I am in a habit. I like to put the treat, uh, the dog bed under the TV because for our perspective, for the dog's perspective, they're looking at us all day long. We're just laying here. Now, uh, she's more aggressive with getting treats, not aggressive, but she's more aggressive by getting the treats. So you might want to have her in the other room and practice having him go there, get the treats, and do the same thing for her. Remember to come up with a funny command where it's not only for the dog bed, for any new command that you come up with. We have a, you have a kid in the house, again, we, um, but if you come over and you say chill, the dog lays down, the kids or friends will be like, your dog is so cool, he said chill, the dog laid down, and they smile. Dogs will read our facial expressions. So if the dog, crash. Uh, if I, this is the word I use, is crash. So if you come up with these fun command words, it motivates the dog to want to do those things for the rest of the dog's life. It helps the dog seem cool to our friends and our kids. Um, and it's just, they're dogs, you should have fun with them. Um, speaking of uh, commands, come up with a list of the official command words. Most of us actually have a list uh, or of about 10 versions of each command word. Come, here, com, come here, over here, here girl, here boy, dog's name, dog's name, so on. So it's harder for them to hear because we say so many words every day. Well, if we get in a habit of only saying come or only saying sit or only saying chill, um, crash, uh, sorry, down. Uh, but that makes it easier for them to learn. They can learn uh, substantially faster and uh, just makes it easier for them to perform the way we want. So if you come in the room and somebody's saying, come here, and the word is come, you say vocabulary, the person says, thank you, come. Now I like to use, if I want to get a dog to come, uh, one of the tricks the guardian asks, um, can you call her real quick? I don't want her to come okay. over. Uh, okay. She's coming over uninvited. I'm going to show you uh, the technique that I use. So what I do is I hold my hand like this, come. like I have a marble in it, and I'm, then I'm going to start lowering it. So I'm going to say her name, Pumpkin. Pumpkin! The lower you go, the more it's for the dog. When he comes, she comes, raise over her head. When she sits down, lower your hand, let her, let her lick the treat off your hand, and then tickle her under the chin. I always do that because eventually we're not going to give a treat. So this way the dog gets used to this motion. And if you see Pumpkin in the shot, she's looking, well, I can't see her eyes, but she's following my hand even though my hand is empty. So if you always deliver a treat that way, and I rock it as a crescent shape over the dog's head, and it puts the butt down, as soon as the butt hits the ground, lower it, let her lick it off your hand, and tickle under her chin. Now she's a little bit, she's not a hard mouth, but she does kind of gobble treats. A uh, great way to fix that is get a big, um, like a soup spoon or a serving spoon that's metal, put some of her kibble or treat in it, and hold it at her, at her nose. She'll bite it with her whole mouth, and she won't like the taste of that metal or the sensation. And after a while, they start using their lips and their, uh, and well, I don't really have lips, but kind of, and their tongue to lick it off. And when she does that, say gentle or soft. Come up with a word that means gentle. So that way you can actually teach her not to uh, grab things too aggressively. Probably part of this is because he's a little wild man. And so she's got, I got to snap it first before uh, he gets it. But she probably always had a little bit of that. So it's just a nice, easy way to fix that. Um, let me see. He doesn't like uh, being in the kennel. He's a little tornado. So what I would recommend the guardians do, and remember how, before I go to the kennel, remember anything that, she, that he is not a fan of. What we want to do is we want to just toss a treat in front of it so that he has to walk towards the object and try to do it with the object stationary or what we call static. And if you want, you want to come halfway, then throw a treat halfway between him and the treat. So you're literally breadcrumbing him towards it. 
And if he has that lean and his back leg is, looks like he's trying to keep it on base, like he's trying to in baseball, keep on to, uh, dropping the treats there until he walks and, linger, and lingers there and doesn't have any lean. Um, so the idea is to make him feel comfortable. We did this with the tennis racket because he didn't like that. But if the guardian mentions she moves something around the house, puts the baby seat in a new place, he barks at it, he protests. So if we help him practice approaching those things on his own speed and volition, good things happen. After a while, and he starts lingering, after a while, he no longer fears those things. I think a lot of this is based on him having cortisol in his blood and then thinking that he's in charge of his humans who don't listen to him, which stresses him out, which makes him have to be more uh, voracious in his disagreements and his protests, and it's just a vicious cycle. So the more the guardians start to enforce these rules, the more he sees them acting like leaders. So not being allowed in the furniture would be one rule. Um, if guardians eat at the table here, so this little area around between the table and the couch should also be off limits for both dogs. Um, and, and telling them to go to the dog bed is okay, but I would maybe even say that when you're eating food, you're not allowed to be on this carpet in front of the couch. So it's a nice line of delineation. They can still walk outside and go where they want, and they're gonna remember, they're gonna probe. Are you checking, are you watching? Are you watching, are you watching? So yeah, watch, set, up for, set them up for success. Have the, uh, have, intentionally do a snack here with one of you, with the other one can correct. You can use those four escalating consequences. Remember, hiss. Number two, stand up uh, and turn to face the dog. Keep the dog in front of your hips until it stops moving, then take, stand, sits, or lies down, then take two steps and only two steps backwards with your belly button pointing to the dog, and then pause for one second and go back to doing what you're doing. Third one is to march deliberately at the dog until it turns sideways or greater away from you. And at that point we stop, and then we go to the second consequence, we're pivoting, dog stationary, take those two steps backwards. And then the fourth one is the leash timeout. If you forget how to do those, I have a video for those as well, so please message me, I'm happy to remind you. Um, other rules, uh, shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food, and you're gonna use the first and the third consequence, march, hissing when he approaches the line, marching towards him once he crosses the line. And when you march towards him, you mirror him, and anything outside the line is base. So you march towards him and march towards him suddenly with some, some gumption in your step. And as soon as he crosses the line, stop. So you don't have to always go to the line to enforce it. You start marching towards him. And once he gets outside the boundary, then you stop. But keep your hips pointed towards him. Now a little trick for this is to do what I call a warm up. When we're cooking, we're distracted. We're paying attention to the ingredients, we're, cook, we're stirring, we're adding this, we're microwaving that. The dog takes advantage of that when we're not paying attention, they sneak, sneak in, and remember you have that three second window to correct your reward. Well, if he sneaks in and your back is turned, you're melting butter, you turn around, he's been there for 10 seconds, you say, get out. It's like, oh, so I can't be five steps in the kitchen? He gets confused. So what I do instead is I microwave bacon or roast beef or something, some meat product. Before I do this, I make the dog leave the kitchen and I walk backwards away from him. So I'm facing the dog. Your authority goes whatever direction you're facing. So I take a step backwards, left foot, right foot, stop. If the dog stays behind the boundary, I take another step backwards, still facing the dog. If I take a step backwards, the dog starts coming forward, I hiss and rush towards them till they get across the line again. You have to do this back and forth quite a few times, but eventually the dog will sit or lie down. Um, so what I usually do is I keep on doing this, backing it up, and then I take, I have the microwave ready to go with the bacon, put it in the, bake, in the microwave, I'm watching the dog as I'm doing this, and then once it gets done, if the dog stays, anytime the dog crosses the boundary, I stop it, I'm gonna rush towards them. Eventually, when I get the bacon or the roast beef out, I put it on the counter, then I start simulating cooking. Really, what you do is just prep your cooking. Pull the ingredients out of the kitchen, out of the fridge, out of the pantry, get your pots and pans, you know, turn the stove on and off, hit the lighter ignition if you have a gas uh, lighter uh, stove and all that. So to the dog, it sure smells like you're cooking, it sure looks like you're cooking, but boy, as soon as I cross that line, you're on me like grease lightning. And then once the dog sits or lies down behind the boundary, thank you buddy, kisses. Um, then I would actually start my actual cooking. The dog doesn't see a difference. Same thing here. If you're gonna eat a meal when we're eating, we're distracted. So instead, get your, get your Chipotle or whatever it is, and then microwave a piece of ham. And then sit down and start cutting it up. And if any, any time they cross the threshold, you stand or you hiss. And after a while, the dog sits or lies down beyond the boundary, then you can actually eat your burrito or whatever it is. You did a warm up and help the dog practice the behavior. And I want you to think about this in general. If your dog is quote unquote naughty, Ask yourself, have I taught the dog how it's supposed to behave? If I haven't, then recreate that situation, make a list of these things. Recreate the situation in the easiest possible version. And then go to step one and practice step one over and over and over again until the dog's automatically offering the behavior that you want. Only then go to your step two, and then step three, and subsequently. And eventually you get all those steps done, then you bring them all together in a string in the easiest version possible again. 
And once I can do that, then we gradually start raising the criteria and we work our way back to the real world situation. Too much temptation for the pumpkin. Um, until eventually the dog learns just because there's food on the table doesn't mean I can eat it. Just because there's guests here doesn't mean I bark at them or rush the door or jump up or whatever these things are. So most of us don't do a very good job of communicating to the dog what we want. Matter of fact, we often do the opposite. Uh, the dog comes and sits in front of us. We ignore it. It lays down. We ignore it. Guardians do a good job of passive training now. Um, but as soon as the dog starts barking, we're get up and correct it. Or as soon as it chews something or does the wrong thing, we immediately give it attention. And any attention is ultimately validating. And for dogs, good attention and bad attention pretty much the same thing. So if my goal is to get your attention and jumping up, there we go. Now that's a little temptation because we have some stuff on the counter. Now the guardian's doing a good job of using the third consequence. There we go. Hey, turn sideways, so stop right there. Now he's looking, or she's looking for other things. Uh, so remember, you're going to, but again, set up, I, I jokingly say there's no uh, entrapment laws for dogs, so set them up. Right now, the family has a young child, so they're really, their attention is split in a lot of different ways. So when you do have time to practice, set up a scenario where the dog fails and help the dog practice when you have the time. Later on, when you don't have the time, you're breastfeeding or doing whatever it is, then you can, the dog kind of knows what's expected from them. Um, speaking of which, um, uh, to flip that script, we talked about petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is if the dog comes up and nudges me or barks at me or paws for attention. If I pet it, I'm telling the dog, yes, you're the boss of me. So instead, communicate to the dog, no, I'm the boss of you. Give the dog a counter order. And if the dog does what you want within three seconds, then pet it under its chin and say sit or crash or whatever it is. If it doesn't do it within three seconds, do something else. Playing hard to get works wonderfully with dogs. So you do it my way the first time I ask, or then I'm on to other things and you missed your opportunity. All of a sudden, when I realize I'm not getting the attention, well, then I'm more motivated to want to do those things. So uh, petting with a purpose is if the dog wants attention from you or you want to pet the dog, you are going to ask the dog to sit or lay down or do something to earn it. I would not recommend shake, because if you like this, you must really like it when I jump up on you. So once the dog does whatever that is, then pet it under his chin and say just the word sit, just the word crash or chill or whatever it is. Not good dog, not what a good boy, just sit. And then you pet as much or as little as you want. You just have to pet once to infinity number of times. After a while, the dog will come start sitting in front of you to prepay for the attention. When it does, make sure you do pet it at least once to acknowledge it. Otherwise, it can go back to nudging you. But now we're motivating the dog to do what we want because that's what gets me the attention. Um, speaking of that, uh, the flip side of that is like what I call passive training. Passive training is just waiting for the dog to do it. Kisses. That's a perfect example of classical uh, of uh, passive training. He stopped kissing or licking me, and he's licking my hand because I've been handling treats all the whole time. But still, the end result. And a lot of times, that's what we train dogs is they accidentally do what we want. We kind of call that shaping. So as soon as it accidentally does what we want, we just reward him with that, that three second window. Um, and you okay? All right. And so every time the dog comes to you, pet it and say, come. Every time it sits, pet it and say, sit, crash, and so on and so forth. Um, now, I, I have watchwords for these things. I say paycheck if I suspect someone's petting without a purpose. That person has to stop petting, tell the dog just sit or do something, and then the dog does it, and we reward it. Passive training is just waiting for the dog to organically offer that behavior on its own. Every time he brings you a toy, name each individual toy. Now, all balls can be balls, all bones can be bones, but if you have one that looks like a little ladder that's twisted, call it DNA. You have a little elephant, call it Trump, or whatever it is. And so coming up with these command words can be really helpful. Um, like uh, one of the things I showed the guardians was how to teach the dog to get off the couch. So I show the dog I have a treat, throw it off the, off the, uh, onto the ground, dog sees it and runs and jumps down to get it. When it licks it up, we say the word off. Now we're putting in context, getting off the furniture is a rewardable activity. And I'm marking it with the word off, so now the dog can do that. Something else I didn't go over with the guardians, but it's super duper easy to do, is to teach the dog to leave every room. All you gotta do is take a treat, Tear a, for him, I was tearing the treats into like six bits because he's so small. Tear a little piece, show him he got it, throw it outside the doorway to the kitchen. When he runs out and licks it up, say the word out. <clears throat> then he come back and do the second thing, do it again. You go to every doorway in your house and throw two treats about three feet outside the doorway. Then once you've done every doorway, and not only doorway, if you want them off the carpet here, throw a treat there, throw a three, treat there, 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 there. So you're putting in context, leaving the carpet is what, it mean, what I mean when I say out. Once I've done all the areas in the house, then I stand outside and I throw the treat in. And this time I'd say living for this room. I would say 
kitchen for the kitchen, dining for there. So now we have a command word to go to every specific room in the house and to leave every specific area in the house. And we do it through passive training. You're loving my hand. Um, so uh, passive training, depending on the purpose, if you can get in the habit of both of these things, every time you pet your dog, it's a micro dog training session for the rest of the dog's life that boosts his self-esteem uh, uh, self and increases its respect for you and also helps it practice the desired behavior. Dogs do whatever gets their attention from us. So just paying attention to petting with the purpose of pastor training will motivate the dogs to do what we want them to do. Um, let me see, we, the video above talk, talks about the counter conditioning. You can do that with a lot of different things. So remember to slow down uh, or lessen the intensity, slow down the speed, increase the distance, or turn down the volume. Um, I'm trying to think, what else? Is there anything else we went over that you guys want me to talk about? Okay. Uh, make sure the guardians are eating something before they feed the dog. And then for him, another rule is he has to sit before we let him in the door. And go to the door, open the door, crack. Oh, he did take a little, there's a little tootsie roll out there for you. Um, open the door, crack, and say sit once. Say it, don't say, can you sit? He's going to say, no, I cannot. So sit, one, two, three. You don't sit by three, I close the door. And even if he barks, I know you don't want your neighbors hearing it, but this is a short period of time. Um, walk away and sit down, like right here. Leave, uh, have the blinds up. So he's like, look at the window, he's like, man, he's having a great time. Why didn't I sit? Darn it. And then after one minute, go to the door and, and open it a crack and command him to sit again. If he doesn't sit within uh, three seconds this time, I walk away for two minutes. Next time I walk away for four minutes, then for eight minutes. I keep double the length of time. So eventually when I say sit, you're not going to do it for me? No, because I'm too cute. Uh, then eventually he'll sit as his way of saying, I'd like to go outside the door or come inside the door. And I'd like you to use an, a, a version of that for everything. If he wants to come out of his dog bed, uh, dog kennel, you have to sit. You want the bully stick, you have to sit. You want me to pet you, you have to sit. Uh, there's a trend here about sitting. Yes, you're trying to get away. We're almost done. Can you hang out for one more sec? Make sure that we feed the dogs, uh, eat before we feed them. All you have to do is eat five bites and come up with a funny command word for each dog to eat. So every time the dog takes a bite, say the word uh, feast or for him, and maybe say, you know, lasagna for her, whatever the word is you want. Do that for about three months. And after a while, when he hears the word lasagna, there's no food in his mouth, but she hears that there's food in her mouth, so that means I get to eat. Uh, yes, I'm talking about you getting lasagna, but you're not gonna be Garfield the cat. Um, so uh, do the same thing with water. Every time your dog drinks water, say the word agua. I have one client calls it happy hour, another client calls it Heineken uh, martini. So whatever your favorite cocktail is, it'll make your friends laugh. Um, one last thing, potty training. Um, so we talked a little bit about potty training. The three times the dogs are most likely to need to go is right after waking up, five minutes after eating, and 15 minutes after the start of playtime. So if you get some zoomies, look at your watch, and after 15 minutes of that, take him outside. Um, I would also give uh, him high-value training treats, like the ones that I'm gonna leave, the tricky trainers. And so when you're out, every, just watch him when he's outside, I would have a different word for potty on, on the potty pad here, and a different word for outside. So that way you can command what you want him to do. Um, so the potty pad, maybe call that deposit, maybe call the other one dump or whatever the words is you want to do. So have high value training treats. As soon as it starts to pee or poop, say dump and say it like that. Don't say dump because that's what will happen and the dog will stop pottying. Now for a dog this small, sometimes uh, clicker training is helpful. If you want to do clicker training, let me know. I'll show you how to do it with, click, with a clicker. But just what you do is as soon as the dog starts to pee or poop, say the word dump. And then when the dog gets done, have a treat. I'll give you a little crack. And then pop the treat in the dog's mouth and say, dump, a second time. And so after a while, the command word of dump is associated with the action, and then the reward is associated with uh, the command word. And after a while, you say, dump, and the dog looks at you like this, you know, it's a no. If you say dump, and the dog goes, then you know that's yes, the dog has to potty. So it makes it easier for you to uh, understand what it is your dog wants. Um, so uh, the potty training, I would, I would just uh, focus on that for about a week to 10 days and really reward him richly with those high value training treats afterwards. After I was like, I will dare not waste this urine inside on the carpet. This stuff is valuable. I do it outside I get a great reward. And sometimes we'll do something called a jackpot. So if he really has difficulty doing it outside, uh, when he's doing it, uh, maybe give him five treats in a row. Say dump, 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 dump. And after a while, I was like, this is a really good place to do this. Um, all right, let me think what else. Is there anything else? Um, for that passive training, uh, every time he comes to you, pet him and say, come. Uh, that, come, thank you, that's a good demo. Um, and uh, the more you do that, the more they're inclined to do it. Because like uh, I mentioned off camera, a lot of times we ask the dogs to do things, it represents the end of fun time. Yes, you're gonna come up, you want the crack, huh? 
this is pretty good for you two. You, usually she stays kind of, uh, he stays kind of away from her uh, because she's kind of aggressive when it comes to getting treats, not aggressive as a behavior, uh, but he's a little guy. Um, so uh, now if you have any questions or problems, please message me. If I don't hear from you, I assume that everything's going great. So I have videos, all this stuff and, and a lot more. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Well, this, I'm a pumpkin. Yeah, I can do it on command. Oh, I bet you if I hold this bully stick, he would come up here. Yeah, but this is his bully stick. Well, that's pumpkin. This little guy over here. Is, well, yeah, so let's not spaz out quite yet. This is Duty Hauser, and this is the roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it. Right, Doogie?